The Bird on Its Journey. It was about four in the afternoon when a young girl came into the salon of the little hotel at sea in Switzerland and drew her chair up to the fire. You are soaked through, said an elderly lady who was herself trying to get roasted. You ought to lose no time in changing your clothes. I have not anything to change, said the young girl laughing. Oh, I shall soon be dry. Have you lost all your luggage? asked the lady sympathetically. No, said the young girl. I had none to lose. And she smiled a little mischievously, as though she knew by instinct that her companion's sympathy would at once degenerate into suspicion. I don't mean to say that I have not a knapsack, she added considerately. I've walked a long distance, in fact, from Z. And where did you leave your companions, asked the lady, with a touch of forgiveness in her voice. I am without companions, just as I am without luggage, laughed the girl. And then she opened the piano and struck a few notes. There was something caressing in the way in which she touched the keys. Whoever she was, she knew how to make sweet music, sad music too, full of that undefinable longing, like the holding out of one's arms to one's friends in the hopeless distance. The lady bending over the fire looked up at the little girl and forgot that she had brought neither friends nor luggage with her. She hesitated for one moment, then she took the childish face between her hands and kissed it. Thank you, dear, for your music, she said gently. The piano was terribly out of tune, said the little girl suddenly, and she ran out of the room, came back, carrying her knapsack. What are you going to do, asked her companion. I am going to tune the piano, the little girl said, and she took a tuning hammer out of her knapsack and began her work in real earnest. She evidently knew what she was about and pegged away at the notes as though her whole life depended on the result. The lady by the fire was lost in amazement. Who could she be? Without luggage and without friends and with a tuning hammer. Meanwhile, one of the gentlemen had strolled into the salon, but hearing the sound of tuning and being in secret possession of nerves, he fled saying, the tuner by Jove. A few minutes afterward, Miss Blake, whose nerves were no secret possession, hastened into the salon and in her usual imperious fashion demanded instant silence. I've just done, said the little girl. The piano was so terribly out of tune, I could not resist the temptation. Miss Blake, who never listened to what anyone said, took it for granted that the little girl was the tuner for whom Mr. Le Propriétaire had promised to send, and having bestowed on her a condescending nod, passed out into the garden, where she told some of the visitors that the piano had been tuned at last, and that the tuner was a young woman of rather eccentric appearance. Really, it is quite abominable how women thrust themselves into every possession, she remarked in her masculine voice. It is so unfeminine, so unseemly. There was nothing of the feminine about Miss Blake, her horse cloth dress, her waistcoat and high collar, and her billy cock hat were of the masculine genus. Even her nerves could not be called feminine since we learned that from two or three doctors taken off their guard, that nerves were neither feminine nor masculine, but common. I should like to see this tuner, said one of the tennis players leaning against the tree. Here she comes, said Miss Blake, as the little girl was seen sauntering into the garden. The men put up their eyeglasses and saw a little lady with a childish face and soft brown hair of strictly feminine appearance and bearing. The goat came toward her and began nibbling at her frock. She seemed to understand the manner of goats and played with him to his heart's content. One of the tennis players, Oswald Everard by name, strolled down to the bank where she was having her frolic. Good afternoon, he said, raising his cap. I hope the goat is not worrying you. Poor little fellow. This is his last day of play. He is to be killed tomorrow for Tabal Dote. What a shame, she said. Fancy to be killed and then grumbled at. That is precisely what we do here, he said, laughing. 
we grumble at everything we eat. And I own to being one of the grumpiest, though the lady in the horse cloth dress yonder follows close on my heels. She was the lady who was annoyed at me because I tuned the piano, the little girl said. Still, it had to be done. It was plainly my duty. I seem to have come for that purpose. It has been confoundedly annoying having it out of tune, he said. I'd had to give up singing altogether. But what a strange profession you have chosen. Very unusual, isn't it? Why, surely not, she answered, amused. It seems to me that every other woman has taken to it. The wonder to me is that anyone ever scores a success. Nowadays, however, no one could amass a huge fortune out of it. No one indeed, replied Oswald Everard, laughing. What on earth made you take it up? It took to me, she said simply. It wrapped me around with enthusiasm. I could think of nothing else. I vowed that I would rise to the top of my profession. I work day and night, but it means incessant toil for years if one wants to make any headway. Good gracious, I thought it was merely a matter of a few months, he said, smiling at the little girl. A few months, she repeated scornfully. Are you speaking the language of an amateur? No, one has to work faithfully year after year to grasp the possibilities and pass on to greater possibilities. You imagine what it must feel like to touch the notes and know that you are keeping the listeners spellbound, that you are taking them into a fairy land of sound where petty personality is lost in vague longing and regret. I confess, I had not thought of it in that way, he said humbly. I've only regarded it as a necessary everyday evil. And to be quite honest with you, I fail to see now how it can inspire enthusiasm. I wish I could see, he added, looking up at the engaging little figure before him. Never mind, she said, laughing at his distress. I forgive you. And after all, you are not the only person who looks upon it as a necessary evil. My poor old guardian abominated it. He made many sacrifices to come and listen to me. He knew I liked to see his kind old face and that the presence of a real friend inspired me with confidence. I should not have thought it was nervous work, he said. Try it and see, she answered. But surely you spoke of singing. Are you not nervous when you sing? Sometimes, he replied rather stiffly, but that is slightly different. He was very proud of his singing and made a great fuss about it. Your profession, as I remarked before, is an unavoidable nuisance. When I think what I have suffered from the gentlemen of your profession, I only wonder that I have any brains left. But I am uncourteous. No, no, she said. Let me hear about your sufferings. Whenever I have specially wanted to be quiet, he said, and then he glanced at her childish little face, and he hesitated. It seems so rude of me, he added. He was the soul of courtesy, although he was an amateur tenor singer. Please tell me, the little girl said in her winning way. Well, he said, gathering himself together, it is the one subject on which I can be eloquent. Ever since I can remember, I have been worried and tortured by those rascals. I've tried every way to escape from them, but there is no hope for me. Yes, I believe that all the tuners in the universe are in league against me and have marked me out for their special prey. All the what? asked the little girl with a jerk in her voice. All the tuners, of course, he replied rather snappishly. I know that we cannot do without them, but good heavens, they have no tact, no consideration, no mercy. Whenever I've wanted to write or read quietly, the fatal knock has come at the door, and I've known by instinct that all chance of peace was over. Whenever I've been giving a luncheon party, the tuner has arrived with his abominable black bag and his abominable card, which has to be signed at once. On one occasion, I was just proposing to a girl in her father's library when the tuner struck up in the drawing room. I left off suddenly and fled from the house. But there is no escape from these fiends. I believe they are swarming about in the air like so many bacteria. And how in the name of goodness you should deliberately choose to be one of them and should be so enthusiastic over your work puzzles me beyond all words. 
Don't say that you carry a black bag and present cards which have to be filled out at the most inconvenient time. Don't. He suddenly stopped, for the little girl was convulsed with laughter. She laughed until the tears rolled down her cheeks, and then she dried her eyes and laughed again. Excuse me, she said. I can't help myself. It's so funny. It may be funny to you, he said, laughing in spite of himself, but it is not funny to me. Of course it isn't, she replied, making a desperate effort to be serious. Well, tell me something more about these tuners. Not another word, he said gallantly. I'm ashamed of myself as it is. Come to the end of the garden and let me show you the view down into the valley. She had conquered her fit of merriment, but her face wore a settled look of mischief, and she was evidently the professor of some secret joke. She seemed in capital health and spirits, and had so much to say that was bright and interesting that Oswald Everard found himself becoming reconciled to the whole race of tuners. He was amazed to learn that she had walked all the way from Z, and quite alone too. Oh, I don't think anything of that, she said. I had a splendid time, and I caught four rare butterflies. I would not have missed those for anything. And as for going about by myself, that is second nature. Besides, I do not belong to anyone. That has its advantages, and I suppose its disadvantages. But at present, I have only discovered the advantages. The disadvantages will discover themselves. I believe you are what the novels call an advanced young woman, he said. Perhaps you give lectures on woman's suffrage or something of that sort. I have very often mounted the platform, she answered. In fact, I am never so happy as when addressing an immense audience. A most unfeminine thing to do, isn't it? What would the lady yonder in the horse cloth dress and billy cock hat say? Don't you think you ought to go and help her drive away the goat? She looks so frightened. She interests me deeply. I wonder whether she has written an essay on the feminine in women. I should like to read it. It would do me so much good. You are at least a true woman, he said laughing, for I can see you can be spiteful. The tuning has not driven that away. Ah, I'd forgotten about the tuning, she answered brightly. But now you remind me. I've been seized with a great idea. Won't you tell it to me, he asked. No, she answered. I keep my great ideas for myself and work them out in secret. And this one is particularly amusing. What fun I shall have. But why keep the fun to yourself, he said. We all want to be amused here. We all want to be stirred up. A little fun would be a charity. Very well, since you wish it, you shall be stirred up, she answered. But you must give me time to work out my great idea. I do not hurry about things, not even about my professional duties, for I have a strong feeling that it is vulgar to be always amassing riches. As I have neither a husband nor brother to support, I've chosen less wealth and more leisure to enjoy all the loveliness of life. So you see, I take my time about everything, and tomorrow I shall catch butterflies at my leisure and lie among the dear old pines and work at my great idea. I shall catch butterflies, said her companion, and I too shall lie among the dear old pines. Just as you please, she said, and at that moment the table d'hote bell rang. The little girl hastened to the bureau and spoke rapidly in German to the cashier. Ach, Fräulein, he said. You're not really serious. Yes, I am, she said. I don't want them to know my name. It will only worry me. Say I'm the young lady who tuned the piano. She had scarcely given these directions and mounted to her room when Oswald Everard, who was much interested in his mysterious companion, came to the bureau and asked for the name of the little lady. Es ist das Fräulein, welches das Piano gesmit hat? answered the man, returning with unusual quickness to his account book. No one spoke to the little girl at table d'hote, but, for all that, she enjoyed her dinner and gave her serious attention to all the courses. Being thus solidly occupied, she had not much leisure to bestow on the conversation of other guests. Nor was it specially original, as it treated of the shortcomings of the chef, the tastelessness of the soup, 
the toughness of the beef, and all the many failings which go to complete a mountain hotel dinner. But suddenly, so it seemed to the little girl, this time-honored talk passed into another phase. She heard the word music mentioned, and she became at once interested to learn what these people had to say on a subject which was dearer to her than any other. For my own part, said a stern-looking old man, I have no words to describe what a gracious comfort music has been to me all my life. It is the noblest language which man may understand and speak. And I sometimes think that those who know it or know something of it are able at rare moments to find an answer to life's perplexing problems. The little girl looked up from her plate. Robert Browning's words rose to her lips, but she did not give them utterance. God has a few of us whom he whispers in the ear. The rest may reason and welcome. Tis we musicians know. I have lived through a long life, said another elderly man, and have therefore had my share of trouble. But the grief of being obliged to give up music was the grief which held me the longest, or which perhaps has never left me. I still crave for the gracious pleasure of touching once more the strings of the viola cello, and hearing the dear tender voice singing and throbbing, and answering even to such poor skill as mine. I still yearn to take my part in concerted music and be one of the privileged to play Beethoven's string quartets, but that will have to be in another incarnation, I think. He glanced at his shrunken arms and then, as though ashamed of this allusion to his own personal infirmity, he added hastily, but when the first pang of such a pain is over, there remains the comfort of being a listener. At first, one does not think it a comfort. But as time goes on, there is no resisting its magic influence. And Lowell said rightly that one of God's great charities is music. And I think we're going to pause here and we'll continue in the next video. I love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.